If you will, open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. We want to return uh, to our study uh, there. We're going to be reading beginning in verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 20 uh, this morning. Again, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, we'll begin in verse 1 as we look at Luke's presentation of what is the final voice from uh, the Old Covenant, the, the, the final Old Testament prophet. And in reality, he is the first voice of the New Covenant. He, he stands as a hinge, as, as a bridge between God's testimony as given through the Old Testament and again, God's revelation in His Son, Jesus Christ, and His testimony given to us in the New Testament. As it's frequently noted when we speak of John the Baptist, we can say one thing with great certainty. John the Baptist came a-preaching. John the Baptist came to proclaim good news. He came to call men and women and boys and girls to repentance. And so let's look this morning at this final epoch of Old Testament history, this first epoch of New Covenant history, this ministry of the voice crying in the wilderness, the ministry of John the Baptist. Again, verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being the governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Ateria, and Trachonitus, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. The word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he went into the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight. And the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree therefore that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds ask him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you're authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. And John answered, them all saying I baptize you with water but he who is mightier than I is coming the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire so with many other exhortations he preached good news to the people but Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them, 
all that he locked up John in prison. Pray with me, if you will, this morning. Father, once again, we thank you uh, for the great privilege of gathering as the the people of God. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your inspiration of the Word of God. Lord, I pray that, that it would indeed be used by your Spirit to to work in each of our hearts, Lord. I pray that you would conform those of us who know you to your will for those that remain in their unbelief. How I pray that on this day you would cause them uh, to believe your gospel, to repent of their sins, and they would come to know you as their Lord and Savior, Lord. We trust you, Lord, and we, uh, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I was told just before uh, we began that there was a a certain amount of confidence that I would not allow the rain uh, to uh, overwhelm uh, my voice. I suppose I've got a couple of more notches to go on the volume button if I uh, need to. Hopefully uh, I won't. Uh, But uh, again, we're uh, thankful for the rain, I, I guess. So, to remind you, Luke, the gospel writer, the the Gentile among the writers of the gospel, one of the three synoptic gospel writers, has told us that his endeavor, his intention, was to write an orderly account, uh, uh, fundamentally, uh, initially, uh, to a man he identified as Theophilus, uh, that he wanted him to, to, with uh, great accuracy, great certainty, great precision, to know about these things that had occurred in and around Palestine, in and around the life and the times of this man, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And so, so he begins to tell us about two very, very unusual births. Uh, a birth of one who would be known as John the Baptist, the, the concern of the text here, uh, uh, a man that uh, uh, was born to parents that were well past uh, childbearing age. And uh, for many of you here, maybe God would so work. You may be thinking you're past childbearing age. And maybe the power of the Spirit would so work in you today that you would bear more children to the glory of God. And all of God's people said, that was a little weak. But God worked to to give uh, this barren couple this very unusual child, one filled with the Holy Spirit uh, from uh, the time of his conception and birth. And then we're told the the story of the birth of the Lord Jesus, how it was announced to this young girl who who was a a virgin and how God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, would conceive in her uh, this child who is to be uniquely one of a kind, Son of God, Son of Man, the the rightful heir to the throne of David, the one who would bring salvation not just to Israel, but to the entirety of the world. And so we're introduced really to the perplexity of both sets of parents. They, They didn't fully understand exactly what was being revealed to them and and, and certainly both children were probably somewhat of an enigma to them as they, they grew into m- maturity. And so uh, last time we, we saw the, the closure on the, the childhood narrative of our Lord Jesus with this uh, really strange episode of him there in the temple. And so Luke wants to tell us now how the, the curtain is going to be withdrawn and Jesus Christ is going to be Uh, revealed through this forerunner, this man, this prophet uh, we remember as John the Baptist. And so Luke, ever the historian, uh, begins by setting the the ministry of John in the course of, of history. He wants us to understand that what he is going to tell us both about John and about Jesus, it is very important that Jesus Christ entered time and space. He entered this fallen world at a particular time for a very real historical accomplishment of our salvation on the cross at Calvary. And so uh, Luke tells us 
about seven particular rulers, five Gentile politicians and two Jewish religious leaders. We're told that in the reign of Tiberius Caesar, about the 15th year, now there's a bit of discussion as to whether uh, he came to power in 11 A.D., or 14 A.D. I'm going to lay that aside and just say he came to power at the appropriate time and 15 years after his ascension, John the Baptist appears somewhere in the 26 to 29 A.D. time frame. It, it uh, coincided uh, with the reign of a, a very uh, notorious uh, ruler in, in the region of Judea uh, at, known as Pilate and the two Herod brothers and certainly Luke is kind of introducing us to some characters that are going to figure very prominently in the story of Jesus as he unpacks it for us over uh, the succeeding uh, chapters. And so uh, not only does he tell us about those that are familiar with us, he, he tells us about one uh, Lysanias uh, who we're not very familiar with, but uh, it seems the secular historians are familiar uh, with his particular uh, regime. And so it is in a, a, a climate of political unrest. Of uh, All of these men were, were jealous. All of them were brutal. All of them had, in some degree, some level of, of competence, but also they all had a high degree of incompetence. And so it was in this kind of a, a mess that John the Baptist appears. And then you have these... Jewish religious leaders, uh, Annas, kind of the patriarch of a family that, that held on to the high priesthood uh, there in Jerusalem for over two decades. Uh, it probably says something about them, uh, that they were uh, compromised, uh, that they were corrupt, that during the time of Roman occupation that they could remain uh, in this particular position. They knew how to straddle the fences. They knew how to, to compromise. And, of course, as we will learn uh, later, uh, they are evil and they are corrupt. And so this man, John, we're told in verse 2, during this particular time frame, uh, we're given a phrase that we see fairly often in the Old Testament. This word of God, God through uh, the working of his uh, Holy Spirit in a unique way that he worked uh, in the prophets and the apostles uh, came upon John and, and gave him revelatory information, information consistent with that which had been written in the Old Covenant and that which would be written in the New Testament. And so John is given uh, the very Word of God uh, to proclaim. And so this this son of Zechariah that Zechariah understood was going to be the one that would go before the promised one, before the Messiah. And so his ministry uh, begins there in that desolate wilderness area around the, the Jordan River. And he begins to uh, call the people to repentance. And so we see this, this very purpose of John's ministry with the quote there from Isaiah the prophet. Very interestingly, this is a quote from chapter 40, uh, the quote speaking of the voice crying in the wilderness. Commentators even many times will say that there's two Isaiahs, kind of a good Isaiah and a bad Isaiah, not, not exactly, but, but there's a, a dramatic transition from 39 to 40 in the book of Isaiah. There is the proclamation of God's condemnation for his apostate nation. They are all the way through those first 39 verses. And then in chapter 40, there is a turn to a promise of a better day, a promise of a coming Savior, the promise of coming repentance that is going to be the definition of God's people. And so it's here that, we, that, that the prophet begins to speak of one who is going to go before this promised consolation given uh, to Israel. And so this one who comes, his message is centered around the, the proclamation of repentance. Now I'm going to kind of pause here and go down just a 
a bit of, of a side road. It's not a new thing. It's been around since at least my teenage years. But it is a very common thing to speak in churches today, in crusades today, in personal evangelism, to speak of a salvation that can be secured apart from repentance. Folks, that's a lie. It's straight from the pit of hell, and it smells like smoke, Jeff Dalton. And so, yes, that... that there, there is no salvation apart from repentance. Salvation is not earned by repentance. It's not even earned by our faith. But God working through His Holy Spirit, and I believe this with my whole heart, working the miracle of regeneration in a dead human heart, a heart that is in rebellion against God, that has no spiritual life ability in it, no ability to, re to respond positively to God, only an inclination to rebel against God. God so works in it and gives to them a desire to turn from sin, to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that, their whole outlook about life is transformed. That's why the John the Baptist could speak of the fruit of repentance being a changed orientation toward all things. And so John came preaching this message of repentance. And, and he preached it to a people who certainly did not believe that they were in need of turning from something to anything. In fact, probably... He offended all of them when he said that you need to repent and, and that you need to be identified with sinners in this thing called baptism. Baptism by immersion in, in the Jordan River. And, and I think very quickly the Jews that had come out to, to hear John the Baptist, and evidently he was quite the uh, phenomenon in his uh, uh, what camel hair outfit and eating, eating locusts and honey. He, he probably was a sight to behold. And so people came to, to hear him. And he said, yes indeed, I'm saying to you, those of you that, that have such great pride in being biologically related to Abraham, you need to be identified with sin and sinners just like the Gentiles do. I know that, that, that you think that's only for uh, Gentile proselytes, that they need to go through the ritual washings. But you too need to understand that you are a sinner and that you're in need of a Savior. And so he will go on and expound upon that in just a moment. But in, in proclaiming this message, that is the very way he's preparing the way of the Lord. Now, all of us here are, are conservative, fundamentalist, bible Bumping hellfire preaching Christians, right? Oh, come on now. We read our Bible literally, right? So John the Baptist had him a construction firm, and he had bulldozers, and he had dump trucks, and he had uh, cranes. Man, my grandson would love to be involved with John the Baptist. He came in straightening the roads, right? Leveling out the hills, doing had Joey Brittner there on the transit, and he'd be trying to talk to those guys out there, and he'd say, "Guys, I'll just come do it myself. Just, just get out of my way." Amen. Amen. Again, interpreting the Bible as it's meant to be interpreted. Isaiah, as quoted by Luke, is being illustrative. He's being metaphorical. That No, there, there, there was not any road construction projects going on, although that was not unknown of in the ancient world when a king would make his arrival into a new region, into a new city. They, they might clear the roads for him. But no, that John the Baptist has come, and, and, and it really seems like the primary way in which he prepared the way for the Lord Jesus Christ is with the cultivation of a handful of disciples that would be among the first who would leave behind everything they loved and everything that was familiar to them. And when Jesus said, come and follow me, guess what they did? They did. They followed him. And so John the Baptist comes preaching a message of repentance in preparation, not about himself, not in, in, in developing this huge ministry that will revolve around him, but all about 
preparing the people and pointing to Jesus Christ. And so he came to prepare the way and to announce to people that indeed, indeed, salvation is here. Salvation is coming. Now, don't take that to mean that up until that point, people weren't saved. People under the old covenant were saved. How were they saved? They were not saved by keeping the law. They were not saved by ritual obedience. They were not saved by offering the appropriate sacrifices. They were saved by God's grace through faith in the God who saved, who would ultimately send His Son, Jesus Christ, into our world. Okay, And so he proclaimed this great message, and he proclaimed that the one who would secure salvation is now among us, that, namely salvation incarnate. As Simeon said as he held baby Jesus, your servant can depart in peace because my eyes have seen your salvation. Now, you talk about revelation. I mean, all the babies that would come through the temple, and, and this old man, through the, through the witness of God's Holy Spirit, knows this is the one. This is the one we've been longing for. This is the one we have been waiting for. This is the one that's going to ultimately and finally accomplish God's salvation for us. And so John get, came to bear witness to him, as, as the gospel writer would say, that the word would become flesh and dwell among us and we would behold his glory. And as John would see this cousin of his walking uh, along the, the streets of Palestine, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I mean, here is John, this popular preacher, got people coming out to hear him, but what does he say? It ain't about me, it's about him. He is the one that we speak of. He is the one that we point to. It is not about me. It is not about my ministry. It's not about my baptism. It's about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As John would say of himself, he, he's not the bridegroom. He, he's like the friend of the bridegroom that, that rejoices at his presence, at his appearance. And so John comes to bear witness to this great reality that salvation is incarnate among us in the person of the Son of Mary and Joseph, the Son of God, the Son of David, Jesus Christ. And so let's look here at the third issue then this morning, the message of John the Baptist, the message of John's ministry. He was so sweet and kind and gentle. He wouldn't ruffle anybody's feathers. You know, just God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life and, and, and your best life now and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, he was, he was all about it. Right? No, he came and he preached. And as, as people came to him in, in droves, and one of the things that, I guess I'll never have to fear if if we ever become a, a mega church, and I hope we do, in, you know, some in some shape, form, or fashion. If God gives that, is that I would compromise to keep people happy, as I told you last week. A, a friend who does attend a mega church told me, said, "I I wish our pastor would be bolder. I wish that he would preach with with greater conviction the truth of the Word of God." And I said. I don't think anybody at North Clay has ever said that about their preacher. I don't know. You know uh, it, anyway, so again, the crowds come out, and, and instead of appeasing them, of tickling their ears, and saying, I'm so glad y'all came. Y'all are a great bunch of, bunch of folks, and, and you're really good folks. And, and, and you know, what did he, what'd he say? You're a brood of vipers. You think you're bragging about the fact that you're children of Abraham. But let me tell you what, you're not children of Abraham, you're children of the serpent. Wow. Now that's how to win friends and influence people. Begin your sermons like that. So his indictment, and, and again, 
I've never been too upset if I anger people about rightly dividing. If I tell you the truth and you're ticked about it, I'm okay, okay? I, I can live with it. Now, if you're ticked because I'm just being a jerk, which you all know I've never, it, it, hypothetically speaking, if I ever were a jerk, okay, it's never happened up to this point, but if it ever were to happen, I would be very upset and prayerfully I would be very, very repentant. But here's the thing, this, this law-based indictment always necessarily precedes the gospel. People that do not know they're sinners, do not know they're lost, they have no need of the Savior. And so it is that law that breaks us, that, that, that breaks us down so that we, we cry out, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. Not a sinner, the sinner. And so John preached this message that, that, that identified them as, as sinful, as, as, as you have nothing to stand before God as something to offer him. And almost in a, maybe, I mean, almost a cynical way, who warned you? to flee from the wrath to come. There is a judgment coming. And again, I, you know, we kind of, I don't know, laugh is not the wrong, you know, but we kind of, you know, the hellfire and brimstone stuff. And, 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 you know, again, growing up in the 70s, I, I saw thief in the night and burning hell. And, uh, the, you know, they tried to scare the hell out of me and all this kind of stuff. And it doesn't work, or it didn't. But, but, but here's the thing. If we're going to speak biblically to people, we must warn them that there is a day that God's sovereign, holy, and yet last night I believe I've even heard His loving wrath is coming. Out of His love for him, Himself and His justice and the vindication of His mercy, that wrath is sure to come upon all of those who persist in their disbelief. And so John warned them so and, and and inquired of them who who told you who told you to, to to come out here and then he he exhorts them with with kind of a threefold exhortation first bear fruits in keeping with repentance sometimes when we talk about conversion about repentance and faith how do i know that i've truly repented i've truly believed do you know how you know if you've truly repented and believed? Do you know how you know if you're born again? Because right now, as you sit here listening to this message, you're still repenting and believing. You still realize the wretchedness of your own dark soul, and you are thankful that there's a Savior who hung on the cross at Calvary for your salvation. And I believe that everything I need to stand before God one day has been supplied in the life of and the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of my Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, again, how do we know? We, 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 we're bearing fruit. We're bearing fruit, and that, that fruit of repentance, and that uh, fruit of, of faith. And he warns them, don't be superficial uh, about this. Don't, don't rely on your, on your heritage, on your inheritance, on your, your ethnic identity. And again, it's been said often enough, just because your mama, your daddy, your granddaddy, or whoever it is was a believer does not automatically make you a believer. You must come to a place in which God so works in you that you are indeed born again. And so the evidence of that is, is, is a fruit that, that he's going to flesh out uh, for us. And again, this reminds me so much of of. of uh, our allusions to Ephesians 2 and our singing uh, uh, from Ephesians 2. Uh, you know, God can raise up children of Abraham from, from rocks on the ground. And that would be a miracle. I'm not sure it's any greater miracle than bringing to life a dead heart. In fact, when he saves an individual, that's exactly what he does. He takes a heart of stone and takes and makes it a heart of flesh. Does he not? Does he not? 
And so it is the powerful working of God bringing to life that which is dead. John continues his warning there that the judgment, the, the wrath is, is close at hand, that the, the axe, is, is, the imagery is it's the axe at the, the root of the trees ready to chop it down and throw it into the fire. And, and certainly as, a, as a, an issue with ethnic Israel, that judgment did soon follow with, with the destruction of the temple and, and the clear sign that whatever unique privileges were Israel through the older covenant had passed away and been superseded, had been surpassed by God's work in the new covenant through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so in saying all of that, verse 10 there, they inquire, they inquire. You know, that is, that's one of the great things in all of ministry is if you proclaim the truth, somebody with the sincerity of heart says, what do we do? What do we do now? What is our, what is our next step uh, in, in relation to, to what you have said uh, to us? Similarly, in, to the Philippian jailer says to Paul, Sir, what must we do to be saved? Paul's answer, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now, that is a, a simple a answer. It's a biblical answer. It's a direct answer. But don't make it simplistic, okay? Don't make it simplistic. Make sure that you, you, that, that word believe bears the weight of all the biblical evidence about what it means to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So, John's answer to their inquiry is that, again, produce this fruit that bears witness, that gives testimony. You're not earning repentance. You're not earning salvation. But when salvation comes, there will be a, a working that is producing evidence in your life. And so he, he answers the crowds that if you have two tunics, that you're to, to share those with those who have none. And if you have food, share that with those who, who have none. That is, you are to manifest a love, a charity, a benevolence toward those who are in need. That, that bears witness to the, the great reality of what God has done in their life. And so he speaks to the, the, the broader group of the crowds. And then in verse 12, a very specific group asked him this question, the tax collectors. I dare say there was, there was not a more despised group of people in the ancient world than the tax collectors that were Jews that conspired with the Roman occupiers to oppress uh, the Jews with an unjust tax system. and In fact, it was so corrupt, basically, uh, the Roman, you, you would bid for that office, and basically, uh, you paid back Rome what, uh, what you bid, and then anything you got over your bid, you got to put in your pocket. So, you can imagine how, how badly the people of, of uh, Judea were being fleeced uh, by, by these uh, men, they were called publicans, and they were, they were hated, and, and they were uh, despised. And we see them appear time and time again in the Gospels. But John's message to them is kind of interesting. It's not quit, which I find a bit interesting. But again, do what you're doing in a way that is honest and straightforward. That is, don't fleece the people. Don't oppress people. Specifically, collect no more than you're authorized to do. Quit being a part of an oppressive regime. Practice justice in your dealings with all men. Again, summarized in what? Love your neighbor. 
as we've often said. You cannot go around with your chest stuck out saying, oh, how much I love God, when you're living in enmity with your fellow man. It simply does not work. You're lying. You're lying. When we get right with God, we will make every effort to be right with our fellow man, and most particularly those who are of the people of God, those who share in the privileges of the new covenant, who have been born of the Spirit of God. And then there's a, a third group in verse 14, uh, evidently soldiers, whether they were Roman soldiers or whether they were uh, Jewish soldiers, I'm not exactly sure, but again, don't resign your commission, just simply do not use your position in an unjust manner by extorting money or arresting people uh, with false accusations and be, be content with what you're being paid. That will bear with it will not again, you're not working for your salvation, you're not earning your salvation, you're giving evidence that salvation has come. And so as he preaches this message and he calls for uh, repentance, there in verse 15, people were confused. And it, it says that, that they were wondering because evidently God was using him in a mighty way. And, and so people were thinking, could this be the Christ, the, the promised one, the, the Messiah, the, 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 the son of David? And, and, and so John really straightens them out there in verse 16. I baptize you with water. You've come out here in the uh, banks of the Jordan River, and, and I baptize you with water, and that's an appropriate thing for me uh, to do. But he who is mightier than I is, is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. In other words, you are granting to me a certain type of esteem. You're, you admire me. You respect me. But I want you to know that, that in comparison to the one who comes, I'm not even the lowliest servant, which would be the one that would come and remove a, a guest's uh, footwear and wash their feet. I'm, I'm not worthy to do that for the one that's going to, to come after me. And so I baptized with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in, in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And so John points to Jesus. Again, kind of pushes himself out of the limelight. There's one more important. Uh, we see later that very willingly when Jesus comes and, and, and takes, in a sense, John's disciples, he's very willing to, to send them on their way with, with their, for their ultimate purpose, namely to serve uh, Jesus Christ. And so this one who is to, to come, he is going to be the one that's going to bring in a new age that is characterized by a more powerful working of the Holy Spirit that we see fully manifested on the day of Pentecost that the Spirit is going to descend and go, is going to remain both within the individual follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and among the people of God. And we've talked about this many, many times. In America, while it is very, very important, we kind of overemphasize this personal indwelling, which is true, it's biblical, but we tend to forget about the reality that God is among us in a unique way as the new covenant people of God. And I believe that the, the greatest experience, the greatest manifestation of the unique way that God dwells among his people is when he calls us together to assemble, to congregate for the purpose of praising his name and hearing the exposition of the word of God. That was a little weak, I barely heard you, but I'll let you slide with it. So, one is coming, 
the good news is the dawning of a new age, a more powerful work. The Spirit was not absent under the Old Covenant, but again, there's going to be a more prominent way in which the Spirit is going to work among the New Covenant believer that's going to be ushered in by the one who follows John, namely Jesus Christ. But the bad news is there's two baptisms, one with the Holy Spirit, one with the fire of judgment. And I want to say to you today, there's only two classes of people in the world. The two classes are this. It is those that have been baptized with, in, by the Spirit of God. That is, they have been born of the Spirit and dwelled by the Spirit. They've been born again. They know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And those that right now are under his condemnation, according to the Apostle Paul, and one day the final perfection, the final consummation of his righteous and holy and just wrath will be exacted upon you. Again, only two types of people. Either you're going, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit or you will be completely immersed, you will be soaked in the baptism of the wrathful fire of God in a place the Bible calls hell. And again, John wants people to understand. Again, I don't think he's trying to scare people. As I've, I've told you many times, if you ever think I'm trying to manipulate you, scare you, whatever the words would be, I do not believe it biblically and theologically possible for me to stomp and snort and spit and hoop and holler enough to cause you to do anything that has eternal value. That is strictly the work of God's Spirit through the rightly divided Word of God. Okay, I just happen to get just a little bit excited about it, though. So Sometimes I have to be reined in just, just a bit. So, again, John wants people to know it, it's soon, it's sudden, it's coming, it is absolutely certain, and it is final. The fire is unquenchable. And then a final word, is it, we're going to close with this. And so John lived happily ever after. He obeyed God. He did God's will. He proclaimed God's message. He got his best life now. He was able to speak into existence uh, all the things that he wanted. Uh, he drove a Lamborghini and had a Rolls Royce in the, in the driveway and the whole nine yards. No, it didn't work out quite that way. He was obedient to God. He was faithful to the end, but he was ultimately put in prison by Herod. And guess what he did? He indicted Herod for living in an adulterous relationship with his sister-in-law. He saw that, that, that woman's daughter dance, and he was so incited to lust that he made an absolutely stupid vow. And because he was so pompous and proud, he stuck by the vow, and when that young lady said what, what she wanted, I want the head of John the Baptist. And so John's life ended that way. In this life, you really, we're not promised it's always going to end so well. But let me tell you this, it always ends well, ultimately and finally. And so... John came a preacher. And I believe that he calls us to continue to preach, to continue to indict as, as, as much as that is not in favor with our culture today. We have, we're supposed to stroke everybody and affirm everybody. And again, make sure you always understand that God's unconditional love is not uncon unconditional affirmation of every stupid act that people can come up with. Okay? Just make, get that clear in your mind. But we are to call, we are to, we're to indict, we're to warn of the coming judgment. And we're to always, always, always invite people to flee the wrath to come through repentance, through faith in the promised Son, the one that, that John saw, that, that, that John spoke of, and that John proclaimed as the one who has accomplished our salvation. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your word, for your truth. I'm not powerful. 
but your word and spirit has been creating the, the church of the living God since long ago, since the beginning of time. And so, Lord, we depend on you. We depend on you to continue to work. You have promised to never leave us or forsake us. You have promised that your word never returns void. And so we pray that your word and your spirit would accomplish its intended purpose in our midst here today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.